Peter, Peter is at it again. The big mouth just can't help himself. Rebuking Jesus? Really, Peter, man, are you okay? Did they have Kool-Aid back then and did you have to drink it? We all know people like him, right? Or are people like him sometimes? The ones who say something wrong, hurtful, embarrassing, and or unnecessary at, say, a family event. And then, after being made aware of their mistake, they don't apologize, they double down. They dig in, as if that could somehow change facts. Did Peter really think he was going to change Jesus Christ, the one he just called Messiah? Did Peter really think he knew better than his teacher? How presumptuous. I would never. Hindsight is a beautiful thing, right? For centuries now, we had the benefit of hindsight while reading the scriptures. So when we read it, we read Peter's blundering comments and misperceptions of Jesus Christ. It's just too easy for us to think we would never make his mistakes. We would never doubt. We would never be afraid. We would never deny Jesus, let alone three times. We would never want to be first in God's affection. We know better, right? We would never try to impress Jesus. I fear I am a lot like Peter. I can absolutely relate to him. Like Peter, I can be too eager to get my theology just right, as if that was humanly possible. Like Peter, I wish God and the world to know that I am a good person. Like Peter, when I'm confronted with a new theological insight, sometimes I'll put up a good fight first. Yeah, I have to admit, there's a good chance I might have put up a fight in Peter's stead as well. Maybe that is why I feel defensive for Peter. Look, he did answer the question right, didn't he? Who do you say that I am? Answer, you are the Messiah. Correct. Gold star teacher's bet, the, the star student. And I love being the star student. Yet somehow Peter still missed the point. But Jesus and Peter are in agreement here, so what gives? It's the correct title, Messiah. The problem is, Peter is a product of his environment, as are we all. And in Peter's environment, in his culture and belief system, the Messiah is somebody like King David, but of course, more powerful. Jesus' lineage was linked to King David's for that very reason. The Messiah, Peter, and almost everyone is expecting then. Looked like that. He possessed the kind of power it takes to conquer the Romans, much in the same way that David discarded Goliath. This Messiah would then usher in a new kingdom like King David did, a kingdom with independence, sovereign power, and he would rule over a united Israel once again. This kind of Messiah may have spiritual blessings and origins, but is mostly engaged with earthly matters, solving problems not in a divine, but in a worldly way. This Messiah is a conqueror of the mortal world, a governing and militaristic savior. That is the Messiah expected by the culture, the people that Peter grew up with, the people he called family and friends. This Messiah is less about God's kingdom and more about the people's kingdom. How is our vision of Christ today? Does humankind still want and expect a being of superior worldly powers, more like a superhero than the son of man? 
Our history shows that even with the benefit of hindsight, we haven't been putting Jesus' lessons into effect very well. Just a few centuries ago, we still wanted God to be in charge on earth and in a visible seat of the utmost earthful of the utmost earthly power. This turned into several wars known as the Crusades. And now, is humanity getting it? Or are we sometimes still like Peter, still waiting for Jesus Christ to lay down the law? But based on what was Peter thinking that? How did he come to that conclusion? Because here's the thing. Peter called Jesus Messiah the authoritative kind of Messiah of his world. But all he has seen Jesus do is healing sick and demarginalized people. Jesus is bringing the ones on the fringes back to community. He's hanging out with the people that haven't got a lick of power. Jesus continuously shows a disregard for that kind of power and their machinations. Jesus builds relationships, not platforms. He operates completely outside of mainstream. He is not, he has not, in any way, shape, or form, shown his disciples in our gospel today any sign that this might change. And he will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Romans before long. There is no sign of any army gathering no sign of Jesus starting to consolidate power. Jesus shows no signs of being the Messiah everyone is expecting. So, Peter's assertion that Jesus is the Messiah cannot really be a factual st statement on his part. Rather, it sounds like a hopeful statement. As they are getting closer, to Jerusalem, Peter, Peter's expectations of Jesus grow. No wonder then that when Jesus describes his actual messianic path as fraught with danger, humiliation, and pain, and ending in being sacrificed on the degrading cross, instead of having the power to crucify the Romans, it's no wonder poor Peter's brain short-circuited. This is the complete opposite of his expectations, after all. His human expectations. Peter rebukes Jesus. Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus rebukes Peter. That's harsh, though, right? Satan? Ugh. I set my mind on human things most of the time. I'm human. Like Peter, I need to learn and practice to set my mind and things on things divine over things human. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. These are Jesus' instructions to Peter, to his disciples, to the people of Israel, and to us. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Self-denial and taking up your cross. Well, don't threaten me with a good time. What kind of blessing is this then? How saved, how good are we going to feel by our beloved Messiah when we deny ourselves that dessert? Or carry the cross of suffering without even being allowed to complain? Some salvation this is. Maybe Jesus was not talking about the suffering that is simply a part of being alive. Like deadlines, bills, disease, and those annoying neighbors on the left. And I can't believe that Jesus would want us to actively seek out suffering for some ill-conceived martyrdom. He didn't seek to die on the cross himself. He accepted it. He accepted it as the natural consequences of his divine actions in this broken world. To carry the cross, then, means to accept the consequences from following Jesus Christ. 
It means putting God's priorities above our self-interest, setting our minds on things divine, not human, even if that means giving up security. Carrying your cross is to bring the good news to others so that they can experience God's love through Jesus Christ. Okay, preacher, great. We'll carry our cross, but tell us again what's in it for us because self-denial and carrying the cross still doesn't sound like a good time. Right you are. No one likes to suffer. I don't. Although I recently experienced a kind of suffering I willingly chose. And not just me, thousands of people. Most of you know that I participated in a Burning Man. For over a week, I camped in the desert. It was hot and windy, and it was cold and wet. And believe it or not, a dust storm on the playa in the Nevada desert is much, much worse than ours here. Didn't think it was possible, but there we are. And burners accept this suffering. If it isn't their first burn, they know exactly what they're getting themselves into and still go. I wondered why for a long time and curiosity will kill me one day probably. So I went. On my second day there, we built a geodesic dome in my camp. This would be our chapel. In broiling temperatures, with biting dust in the air. After a few hours of this, a strange, sweaty man visited our camp lugging around a heavy cooler. His costume was something else. He put down his load, and with a big smile, he opened it and handed all of us popsicles. Nothing ever tasted this good, and I have never seen a cooler costume in my life. No weird stranger he, but my new best friend. See, here's the thing. When we all carry our cross, we carry one another. When we carry the cross, it carries us. It was my job to help build this dome as a chapel for all campers, so I accepted it. That meant I accepted the sweat, the strained muscles, the bruises, the dust that bores into your skin, the suffering. It was his job to go around all the camps and make sure his neighbors are hydrated while they're building, lugging around a heavy cooler. These jobs are not assigned by somebody. They need to be done, and people sign up to do them. They start carrying that cross when they see it needs to be carried. In this way, everyone did their part, carried their cross, and was in turn held up by a neighbor doing the same. When we all carry our cross, we carry each other. And that, that does sound like a good time. That even sounds a little bit like God's kingdom, not in the distance, at some unknowable day in time, but right at our fingertips. Wherever we are in life, when we carry our cross, it carries us into God's love. Like our Messiah says, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Amen. <laughs>